Uh, if you were in this room before lunch, you saw Mike Tujeron give a talk about virtual clusters as well. Mine's going to be kind of a different focus. Um, uh, so I had this title, Virtual Cluster Tips and Tricks, and it's kind of clickbaity. And I was hoping that would get me into KubeCon, and it didn't, which is why I'm here. But, um, but I want to get you all really pumped up about virtual clusters. So I, I think let's try to make it even a little more clickbaity. So how about 10 virtual cluster tips and tricks that will surprise you? That seems pretty good, but, but I think we can take it farther. Um, how about 10 vCluster tricks that will make you a cloud native rock star? Yeah, so um, I'm Rich Burrows. I'm a staff developer advocate at Loft Labs. Um, we are the folks who maintain this project we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm creator and host of a podcast called Cube Cuddle that you might have heard of. If you haven't, um, check it out. I interview lots of folks from the Kubernetes community. Um, I've talked to Kelsey Hightower, Liz Rice, Justin Garrison, Stephen Augustus, all kinds of folks. So you should be able to just search for that in your podcast player. Um, before getting into developer relations, I worked in operations for like 20 years. And so I have seen some things. Um, and I'm Rich Burroughs on Twitter is the best place to find me, um, but it's the same on GitHub and LinkedIn too. So what we're gonna cover today, um, the why and what of virtual clusters, um, some vCluster tips and tricks, and some use cases for virtual clusters. So multi-tenancy for Kubernetes is hard, y'all. Um, and in the past, there's mainly been two multi-tenancy models, um, namespace-based isolation and what I'm going to call cluster-based isolation. So with namespace-based isolation, um, tenants are restricted to one or more namespaces using tools like RBAC and network policies. Um, some of the pros here, it cuts down on cluster sprawl. Um, there's less wasted resources because we're really packing those workloads in. Um, some of the cons, the users can't manage global objects like CRDs, and you don't want them to do that in production, right? But if, if this is somebody's dev environment you know, on a shared cluster, they're gonna wanna be able to do things like that. Um, they may wanna run multiple microservices in different namespaces that need to talk to each other, and then you start making exceptions in your network policies. And the gist of it is that these environments can get very complex when you've got a bunch of people all trying to do their own specific thing. Now, the other um, option is what I'm going to call cluster-based isolation, where everybody gets their own dedicated cluster. And um, in fact, if you look under your chairs, I've given everybody a free Kubernetes cluster for attending today. Um, so some of the pros here, uh, better isolation, um, less complexity in each cluster, which is great if you're troubleshooting problems. Um, some of the cons. It's difficult to manage a whole bunch of clusters, right? And there's some organizations that have tens of thousands of clusters or more, you know? Um, there's wasted resources because we're not packing the stuff in. We maybe just got a few things running on, on this cluster. And the cost can be a big issue too. Um, I love to shout out this talk um, that Holly Cummins gave at KubeCon a couple years ago. Um, she used this phrase that I really love. She talked about zombie clusters. And what she meant is clusters that are out there and they've got workloads running, but nobody's actually using them, right? And maybe nobody even knows they're, at, they're out there. And the reality is that this stuff uses up power, you know, and it's not good for the environment. So um, it's something to think about when we're thinking about multi-tenancy. Um, so if you get a chance, it's a great talk. So you're the platform team, you know, which of these buttons are you gonna push? So there's another option now, um, virtual Kubernetes clusters. A virtual cluster runs inside of a shared host cluster, but it appears to the user as if it's their own dedicated cluster. Um, we're gonna be talking about vCluster today, which is an open source project that was launched in April of 2021. Uh, we maintain it at Loft Labs, but there have been some great community contributions too. We're gonna talk about some of those. Um, it's been like, you know, well over a year now since this thing's been out and we've been adding some really cool new features and that's part of what I wanted to do in this talk is let people know about some of the things that have, that have shown up in the project. Um, it's currently the most popular implementation of virtual clusters. Um, that's not a brag, it's just uh, become really popular like over the last year. Um, it's a certified Kubernetes distribution, which means it passes the CNCF's conformance tests and it's really fast and easy to use. So how does vCluster work? The virtual cluster runs inside a namespace on a host cluster. The vCluster itself contains a Kubernetes API server and some other tools. And it saves its state inside the namespace in a database. 
and that's SQLite by default, but um, you can use etcd or even like Postgres or MySQL. So I want to talk about, through an example of the architecture, um, uh, just using EKS as, as an example here, it could be any Kubernetes, um, but you've got this um, shared cluster. Um, uh, there's a control plane with all the normal stuff. As an admin, I'm going to connect to the API server or have tools connect on my behalf, right, to manage that, that context of that, that underlying cluster. But we can carve out a namespace here for a user and install vCluster inside of it. So there's a vCluster pod, and it's got some things in it. So we talked about the API server and the data store. Um, there's also a controller manager, and then there's this thing called the vCluster syncer. And the syncer is really the secret sauce of vCluster, although it's not secret because it's open source, but um, it's really the magic. It's the thing that really makes this all work. So I'm a tenant. I connect to the API server of the vCluster, and I manage the context of it. I can create namespaces inside there, and I can launch, launch deployments, um, pods, all kinds of stuff. Now, if you look on the orange vCluster line, there's one thing that you won't see there, and that's a scheduler. Um, vCluster, by default, doesn't have a scheduler in it. And that's where the syncer comes into play. So when I launch a pod, the syncer tells the underlying cluster to schedule it. And so this is a really uh, you know, uh, uh, basic look at, at how this all works. The client is a little go-binary. Go it's really easy to install with Homebrew, or you can download it from the GitHub releases page. As of a few months ago, it's signed with Cosign, which is really great. So thank you very much, developer guy, on Twitter and GitHub for that contribution. I'm a big fan of SigStore and, and all of that stuff. So it was really fun to see somebody contribute that. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, can we do questions at the end? Yeah, thanks. Um, all right, I got a quick demo for you here. And so um, we're inside the host cluster. There's some namespaces. Um, we're going to create a vCluster called rejects. This is pretty fast. It's going to create the namespace for the vCluster. And then you'll see it actually does a Helm upgrade to install it. Um, and then it connects. And um, when it connects, it switches your context over to the context of the virtual cluster. And then um, we're going to get the namespaces inside the virtual cluster. You can see those are the defaults, and they're all really new. Um, we can create a, a namespace inside here and launch a deployment in it. And look at those pods. And all of this just looks like normal. Now we're going to disconnect, and what disconnecting does is, uh, besides disconnecting, it also is going to switch our context back to the host cluster. So now we're talking to the underlying cluster. And let's look at the namespaces here now. And what we're going to see is that it created, we made a vCluster called rejects. It made a namespace called vCluster-rejects. And you can see that's a lot newer. And let's take a look at the pods on here. And these bottom ones from that namespace, you're going to see there's the reject zero pod, and that's the vCluster pod itself, where all those things are in there. And then there's core DNS. It uses core DNS. Um, and then you see those two Nginx pods that we launched. Uh, but they're, they're a little bit weird. If you look at the names, um, what the, the syncer does when it tells the scheduler to schedule these pods, it renames them. And it includes the name of the vCluster and the namespace inside the vCluster, so that way we can avoid collisions. And that's it for the, the intro. Um, let's get into the tips and tricks. Um, as they say on YouTube, let's get right into it. Um, number one, vCluster distros. So the distro is the Kubernetes that's installed inside the virtual cluster. And the default is K3S. That's what we started off with. Um, that should work for most things. Um, but somebody came to us at one point, and they were like, hey, could you support K0S? And we were like, sure, that'd be cool. Um, so we added that. And then not too long after that, um, Lucas, our CEO, and I were on um, the AWS containers from the couch stream, which is really fun if you've seen it. Um, Justin Garrison is one of the hosts. A few hours after the stream, there was a PR from Justin adding EKS to the list of distros. So that was really cool. Thank you, Justin, for that contribution. And then there's um, one called Kates, which is just a, a standard Kubernetes. Uh, number two, creating virtual clusters. So there's three ways to do this. Um, there's the vCluster create command, which is what we saw in the demo video. 
there's a Helm install, or you can install with the cluster API provider. So I'm not gonna talk about the connect because we already saw that, but the Helm install um, or the create, it's, it's actually used by that vCluster create command. So you saw it does a Helm upgrade, but you can just install via Helm directly if you want. And this is a really great option if you're doing GitOps or something like that and you wanna automate the, the creation of these things. So um, inside the vCluster repo, there's a charts directory and there's a directory inside of charts for each of these different distros that we just talked about, right? And, and so you can look at the Helm charts for them and in each of them, there's a values.yaml file and that's all of the values that are used when the vCluster is created. So you can, you can create your own values.yaml file to override some of those if you want. Um, yeah. The cluster API provider, um, cluster API is used to provision Kubernetes clusters and manage their lifecycle. Um, to use the provider, you need the cluster CTL CLI um, for the cluster API and um, it creates vClusters in the local cluster. And what I mean by that is the cluster you were sending the cluster CTL commands to, that's the place that the virtual clusters will get created. So we do have a separate GitHub repo for the cluster API provider. Um, it's got more info there in the readme. There's also a page in the docs about this. Um, this is a really short example right from the readme of a script you could run to uh, create one of these clusters with the cluster API. Um, you can see there's a line there that you could uncomment to have it pull in a Helm values file if you wanted to do that. Um, and it just runs the cluster CTL generate cluster. Um, exposing a vCluster, and we're not talking about blackmail or anything like that. Um, we're talking about making it so that people can connect to the vCluster. And so um, we talked about vCluster, uh, or no, we haven't covered vCluster connect yet. Um, so vCluster connect, um, uh, is what you can use if you're not already connected to the vCluster. So we saw that when you do create, it connects you automatically, but you can also run vCluster connect. And when you run that um, for remote clusters, it actually uses port forwarding automatically um, to port forward you to the remote cluster. Um, you also can set up a node port service. Um, vCluster Connect will use that if you're using a local cluster. So like in my demo, I was using Docker Desktop. Um, it just sets up a node port and you don't need to port forward or anything. Um, you can use a load balancer and there's a double dash expose flag for that. Um, or you can use an ingress. And uh, lots of details to all this stuff. Um, there's a really good page on the docs. If you look in the docs um, for the page, it's, it's got exposing in the title. Um, so if you were in here before lunch, I was actually going to do a demo of this. You can run a vCluster inside a vCluster. Um, Mike covered this pretty well in his talk, if you didn't get a chance to see it. But he, um, he created lots of vClusters inside of vClusters. But basically, you can create a vCluster, um, connect to it, and then run vCluster create and create another one inside of it. Um, you could go down a lot of rabbit holes. I think Mike in his demo had like 18 levels in that he went. Um, there's, uh, I don't know that there's a real legit use case for this. <laughs> there, there might be some, uh, but it's, it's fun to do. So it's something to play around with um, if you want. Um, number five, isolated mode. So we talked about the namespace-based isolation and the cluster-based isolation. And vCluster is like somewhere on the continuum between those two things, right? And, and I think that, um, that uh, you know, there were people who were coming to us and they wanted more isolation. They were starting to come up with more use cases that required it. And, and so we had the idea for this isolated mode. Um, you just give it a double dash isolate flag and it creates a pod security standard, a resource quota and a limit range and a network policy if your CNI supports that. And um, you can override the values of these things like what the quota numbers are and things like that in the, in the values YAML file. Um, number six, pausing and resuming. Um, this is a really quick way if you want to just suspend workloads um, instead of like throwing the cluster away. Um, so what it does is it sets the replicas to zero and vCluster itself is a stateful set, you know? So, uh, so it actually does it for the workloads that you create, like the deployments and things, but it does it for vCluster itself. And so basically all the pods just go away. And the nice thing about this is that it's all still configured, right? And so the workloads are gone, but everything is still there. And so when you do, when you do resume, then it just uh, spins back up all the pods again. So this is um, a, a thing to use if you wanna like, you know, uh, get rid of those workloads that are running, but not lose all your state. 
Um, applying manifests and charts, number seven. This is a newer thing uh, that got added that's super cool. So basically, when the V cluster spins up, you can have it um, apply Kubernetes manifests um, or Helm charts. Um, and uh, you can specify the manifests and the charts in the values.yaml file. Um, you can apply the YAML public Helm charts, or you can even pass in tarballs for like a private chart. Um, got a quick demo of this. So I have a YAML file here, and it's got the, it's pointing at the JetStack cert manager. Um, and I'm gonna just create the vCluster and point it at that file. And you'll see that this is still really, really fast. And once we get connected, um, we can take a look at the namespaces here. And we'll see that it's created um, the cert manager namespace. And you can see it's actually just a little bit newer than the others because it got done after the cluster was created. And, uh, and the pods are in there. So this is a way to just sort of bootstrap things, you know, um, to go from having uh, just a, you know, really vanilla virtual cluster that spun up to something that you could actually use. And so like as a dev team, potentially you could leverage this to like set up your dev environments or something like that. So shadow IT, <laughs> um, so this came up, I don't know if you've heard of Brett Fisher, but um, we were on his stream, he's a really great guy. And while we were on there, uh, people were asking questions and they were talking about IT. And they were saying, yeah, we have to go to IT to like, and open up a ticket to get a namespace. And it just blew my mind, right? Because I'm used to working for small startups and thinking about platform teams and it's like, yeah, we've reached the point in history where people are opening up tickets to get a namespace on a Kubernetes cluster, you know? So somebody mentioned that, hey, if you, you know, you could use this thing to get yourself a full cluster if you wanted to. So if you have access to a namespace, you can probably run it. Um, it needs the edit permissions, I think, but not a lot else. Um, the administrators are gonna see the pods, but that's about it. Um, do consult your company's policies <laughs> before you try this at home, though. Um, Number nine is plugins. Um, so plugins showed up a while back, um, and what they do is they change the behavior of that syncer. So we talked about the fact that the syncer syncs the pods, but you can have it sync all kinds of different resources, and it can sync things in both directions, potentially. And so um, you'd write plugins to, to do that. Um, they're written in Go. Um, we have a plugin SDK um, that um, can help you get started if you wanna do that. It's got some examples in it. Um, and we also recently created this vCluster plugins um, repo where uh, we want to share um, contributions from the, uh, from the community. So, you know, if you write a plugin that you'd like other people to be able to use, you know, um, open up an issue there and let us know about it. Um, there's a couple more examples there too. Um, there's a cert manager one and one that syncs contour resources. So, um, yeah, feel free to have a look at that. And number 10, our last tip is high availability. So. When we started off with these virtual clusters, we were thinking a lot about, you know, like dev environments and ephemeral environments, but people are starting to use it for things that are a little, a little more real, right? And we're starting to hear from people who are using it in different kinds of uh, use cases that I would call production. And um, some of them wanted high availability. So um, there is now an option where you can create multiple copies of the vCluster components. Um, this works with that distro called Kates. You can't use it with the other ones. Um, and you specify the settings again in the values.yaml file. So here's an example of the command line. You would just specify the distro and point it at that file. And this is an example of what you would put uh, in the file. This is just right from the readme. Um, you just specify the number of replicas that you want for the different things. And that is it for the tips and tricks. And so I just wanna talk really briefly about a few different use cases um, for vCluster that people, uh, um, that seem to be pretty popular. Um, the first one is dev environments. Um, the second one is CICD pipelines. And the last one is testing Kubernetes resources. So dev environments, um, I'm a developer, I'm writing something that's gonna run in a cluster. I want a local or remote Kubernetes cluster that I can run my workloads in while I'm developing. Um, I want this to be self-service and I want it to be fast. So some of the challenges here, uh, not everybody wants to be a Kubernetes admin. And honestly, you know, th this comes up for discussion uh, sometimes. And I, I have a lot of empathy for the developers who don't wanna be, right? Because they're hired by a company 
to write a service or an app or whatever to deliver business value, right? And that's what they're getting measured on, on what they deliver, not how much they know about Kubernetes. And then, you know, another challenge is, you know, uh, especially if the folks don't know a ton about Kubernetes is that things may just break. Um, and, you know, do you want to uh, spend a lot of time troubleshooting? Do you want to involve the platform team to help them figure out what's broken? Um, so how can vCluster help? Um, creating and deleting clusters takes seconds. They could uh, pause and resume workloads or even just start over from scratch if they just want to um, uh, take another stab at it. And it works with both local and remote clusters. So use case number two, CICD pipelines. Um, I actually think this is like one of the, the strongest use cases. It's a really, really good one. And in fact, even um, CodeFresh not too long ago launched a new feature where they spin up ephemeral um, Kubernetes environments for pull requests, and they're using vCluster to do that. Um, so some of the requirements here, um, we want to be able to create and destroy clusters. Uh, we want quick provisioning, and we want to be able to automate this, obviously. So some of the challenges, um, clusters may be provisioned many times in a test suite. So um, if you worked with testing a lot, you know, there's some times where you hit a point where you just want to throw everything away, right, and have a brand new environment for the next set of tests. And the problem is that if you're waiting 10 to 20 minutes to provision a cluster on your cloud provider before you do that, it's going to add a lot of time to how long your test suite takes to run. Um, speed issues can impact both the developer's feedback time and the time it takes to push out your changes. If this pipeline is how you promote changes to your production environment, if you're waiting around you know, for a cluster to provision for 20 minutes, then it's going to slow that process down too. And how can vCluster help? Um, we talked already about how fast it is. Um, you could potentially run tests concurrently in separate virtual clusters. And um, if you've worked with uh, trying to optimize test suites, um, a lot of times that's, that's like the lowest hanging fruit, right? Like which of these things can I run in parallel? And it's easy to automate the vCluster creation with uh, Helm or the cluster API. And the last one, testing Kubernetes resources, so like, um, you're developing an operator and you want to test it across multiple Kubernetes versions. Um, or you want to be able to test uh, an upgrade. So um, there's a new version out. Um, I'm just going to upgrade my virtual cluster and just see if all of our stuff still runs or if my test passed or whatever. Um, or you could be doing something more ad hoc. Some of the challenges here, um, hardware requirements and cost can be a challenge depending on what scale you're doing this on. Um, and of course, the provisioning time, like we talked about, you don't want people sitting around and waiting, you know, while um, their their clusters are getting provisioned. Um, how can vCluster help? You can specify the distro version with the double dash version flag when you do vCluster create. So we talked about the distros, and um, um, you can specify a version of the distro. Now, the the caveat here is that not every distro supports every version of Kubernetes. So like if you look at K3S, there's not a K3S for every single version of Kubernetes in existence. So if you're using that distro, you might have to pick the closest one or whatever, but you could always use that Kate's distro um, um, if you need to get super specific. You could potentially test multiple versions in parallel because these things are so fast and, and so cheap. Um, and that's it for testing. Um, there are lots more use cases. So some questions you can ask yourself, um, does your thing run in a Kubernetes cluster? Um, do you need to create and destroy clusters quickly? Um, are you concerned about cost? Like these are all things that might make you wanna check this tool out. Some resources here, uh, the biggest one by far is vcluster.com. So that has links to um, the GitHub and the docs and lots of stuff there. So that, you know, if you remember anything, remember vcluster.com. But um, here are the links to those different GitHub repos that I talked about, the SDK and the plugins and the cluster API provider. We also have a community Slack um, that has the maintainers in it, but also a lot of users and the users are starting to help each other more, which is really cool. Um, there also is a vCluster channel in the main Kubernetes Slack. So if you go in the Kubernetes Slack, there is a, a vCluster channel there. It's a lot newer and not as many people know about it. So it's like the maintainers and me and a few other people. If you want to come talk to me, it's a great place to do it. But um, you might get uh, better answers by, by using our Slack. But you're welcome to ask in the Kubernetes Slack too. Um, we are hiring. Um, if you know anyone who loves Kubernetes and is looking for a DevRel job, actually, I'm going to be opening up a rec, like probably in the next few weeks. <laughs>
I um, want to thank um, Oleg and Carl from our engineering team at Loft Labs who gave me some help with this. Um, also, the rest of the vCluster maintainers and contributors. Um, I want to thank the organizers here. Um, I've helped organize community conferences. It's a lot of work, like a lot more than you would think. So thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank you all for watching. And that's it. Yeah. Which, which distros are the default to and, and why? Um, K3S. Um, and the why is, uh, it's a little bit of a story, but I'll tell it. So um, if you all know Darren Shepard, um, who used to be at Rancher and then Sousa, he did kind of a proof of concept of this idea at one point using K3S. And, and his proof of concept was like, like maybe 10% of the way we've gotten with vCluster, right? It was just really, really initial, like, can I make this happen? He used K3S for that. Um, when, uh, when they built vCluster, they, they went ahead and used that as well. Um, that's really the big reason, I think. Um, Darren's actually a big fan of vCluster. He's, he's actually an advisor to our company now. Um, but, uh, but that's where it comes from. But like, uh, you know, use whatever one is gonna work best for you. Yeah. Um, how do you do that? It says in the green layer, the scheduler yeah. is a call through. So if you're trying to test 1.25 in a green fee cluster, but you're on 1.3. Yeah, you're, you're right about that. It's not perfect, you know, and, you know, uh, there's things like um, you're not going to be able to, like, use a host cluster that's got APIs that have been deprecated in the newer version. So it's, it's not going to work for everything. Um, I think there actually may be some magic in the sinker. I think there are some of those cases that they know about specifically where APIs have been deprecated, where they, they've written in something into the sinker to deal with that. But I, I certainly can't promise that's going to work for everything. Yeah. Mike. What's your favorite use case for the uh, You know, uh, I really do think the CICD one is probably my favorite just because um, in, in my operations roles, a uh, long time ago, I'm old, I worked in um, this role that a lot of people called back then like an application administrator. So I was almost like the ops person embedded with a dev team, right, and helping them get their stuff deployed and configured and troubleshooting problems with it. And, you know, one of the things that we dealt with a lot of the time was like uh, tests, you know, and how long it took these test suites to run. I worked at another place where we were making software that got installed on-prem, and I think our full test suite took like 18 hours to run, you know? And so we would run it on the weekend, the full thing, because we just couldn't, you couldn't do it all the time. And, and this kind of stuff, it really makes a big difference to people, you know? Um, when we talk about self-service and we talk about time to get feedback, um, a lot of times people think of that in terms of like developer velocity, right? And that's important, you know, but, but I like to think of the people too, right? So you're the developer who's waiting for that feedback. What are you doing, you know? Um, are you happy about your job? <laughs> you know, when you have to wait 18 hours to find out if your thing worked or not, you know? So, so I really think that people are a lot happier in their jobs and, and more productive as well um, when they're able to get that feedback faster. So that's my favorite one. Um, but, um, but yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of fun ways you can use it. Yeah. Um, sorry, could you speak up a little? How would you go about providing trouble isolation for the application runtime uh, as something that's deployed through vCluster? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could use the isolated mode for that. Um, so um, that would set up, you know, some network policies, or you could, you know, use your own network policies, something like that. Um, the other thing, and I've, I've talked about uh, vCluster with uh, some folks that I know who are huge security nerds, and um, one thing they've, they've mentioned as well is, like, you, of course, still need to do all the normal stuff on the host cluster too, right? Like you want to be doing admission control and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, like just the fact that you're isolated a little bit doesn't, you know, doesn't protect everything. Um, it's uh, it's kind of interesting. We talked about this like in the Q&A after Mike's talk, but but one of the things that does happen with using these virtual clusters that's, that's kind of interesting, and I don't think it's really something that we necessarily intended, but like, 
you're, you're kind of getting API federation too, right? Because you know, if I'm a tenant, I'm connecting to the API server of the V cluster, and most of those API requests are getting managed inside the V cluster. Um, and, and some of them, you know, get passed on through the syncer, but most of it doesn't. So, um, and not an answer to your question, but it just made me think of it. You know, it's, a, uh, it's another kind of fun thing about it. If you're in a, a situation where you've got users making a lot of API requests and you're having trouble keeping up with that, you know, something like this could potentially help. All right, um, is rough round? <laughs> Um, I think I, we still have like five minutes, but um, I'm not going to force anyone to ask questions if you don't have any. Oh, oh yeah. So that, that discussion made me think of something. If yeah. you've got an API server in your view cluster, it's not going to inherit the admission control that you set up on the host API server because it's not the same cluster, technically. Can't I now uh, use that? No, because the pods are scheduled by the underlying container. So the admission control is still going to take a, in effect there. Yeah. So if you had an OPA policy on the deployment, yeah. then it won't because the deployments right. are not synced, but the pods themselves are synced. So Got if you have an admission yep. controller against the pod itself, it will still be blocked or admitted or mutated. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Mike. All right, well, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up then. <laughs> um, thank you all. I really appreciate you coming. This was a lot of fun.